So I knew growing up that I was different, different from the other guys in my neighborhood. See, sports weren't at the top of my list. I enjoyed spending time with my Aunt Jetty. And every Sunday, she would place us in front of the Channel 8 affiliate here to watch the Grade 8 films. And I fell in love with the likes of Lana Turner in Madame X and the incredible tearjerker imitation of life. I watched Susan Hayward become Barbara Graham in the story I Want to Live, the first female executed in California. That same aunt told me about my very first audition at the age of 10. I auditioned for a television show called Palmerstown USA, which was a collaboration between the late Alex Haley and Norman Lear of All in the Family fame. I didn't make it, but the bug was there, and I really wanted to be in the entertainment industry. And so a chance meeting with the late author Elin Harris, who wrote a book titled Invisible Life, which spoke to me as a young black gay man, spoke volumes. It, it allowed me to be who I wanted to be. And Lynn, I shared with him in conversation because we eventually became friends. And I said, Lynn, I've always had this desire to be in the entertainment industry. And he said, well, Rodney, as a matter of fact, the company that's handling my PR is looking for an assistant. So maybe that's a way of getting in through the door. So I went for the interview in June of 1992. In August of 1992, I moved to New York working as the administrative assistant to the president of this PR company. Wonderful. I made Jack, as young people say. I made $12,000 a year. Don't know how I made it, but I did. So the perks of being in the entertainment industry were free movie premieres and industry parties and meeting celebrities. So it was great. It kind of balanced out what I didn't make in my pocket. It also afforded me the opportunity to write and actually get paid for it. But the other thing that came about during this time in New York was that I fell in love. And we all look for that important love, that one love. And everything was fine in the world. I was 25, I was about to turn 25, I'm sorry. And everything was great. So I turned 25 in September of 1993. And shortly thereafter, I received a call from my mother, who shared with me that a dear friend of mine had recently passed from HIV infection. And so my partner and I at the time went out to dinner, and I told him that it's something that we should do. And he kind of hem and hawed, eventually said, you make the appointment, we'll go. We kind of kicked the can down the road, and I wound, wound, didn't officially go until sometime in November of that year. And when I was actually planning for my trip, my very first trip to California, because one of the groups I represented at this PR company was the group called Riff. They were featured in the motion picture Lean On Me. They were the group that did the Fair East Side song with Morgan Freeman. And so while we were in California, I had the opportunity of booking them on the Arsenio Hall show to sit, with, sit in with the posse. And my mom recorded us on VHS at that time. And you see us in the audience. And I'm excited because my mom was a big fan of Arsenio Hall. And I said, Mr. Hall, I know Christmas is right around the corner. I would love to give my mom an autographed photo if, if it's at all possible. And so I flew back to New York with the special gift from my mother. But before leaving for that trip, I went to get tested. My partner at the time, again, hem and haw, didn't show up for the test. When I returned to New York, jet lag kind of kicked my behind, and I dragged myself out of bed after receiving the call from the New York City Health Department to come down for my test results. And two weeks prior, Janine was the young lady who greeted me at 28th and 9th, the city, city Health Department in New York. 
We exchanged pleasantries, and before I left, she gave me a card, 1277597. So when I returned, I was wearing a pair of green denim jeans, a Born to Americans t-shirt, because that was a group that I represented at the time, a black baseball cap, a flannel jacket, and my black, base, my black backpack. And I had already planned in my head, I'm going to go get these test results, and then I'm going to go and pick up my check from my trip, go to the grocery store, and try to make amends with my partner. So at roughly about 2.58 p.m., as I entered into Janine's office, we talked and I shared with her that I couldn't wait to go home for the holidays because I had this picture from my mother. She said, can I see the card? 1277597. That was my identifier. And so she turned, she retrieved a folder, and she looked to see if the number corresponded with the number that was on the card. And she looked at it. And I thought I was a good read of people, but there was no expression. And so she closed the folder, and she came and she sat beside me, and she opened the folder, turned it around, and it said, patient has tested HIV antibody positive. I just turned 25 years old. She handed me a packet of information as she shared with me that I needed to quit smoking because it was toxic to my immune system, that I needed to peel my fruits and vegetables because they contained pesticides that were toxic to my immune system. So instead, I got on the train and I went home and I stopped by the local bodega as well as the local liquor store, and I got a fifth of Bacardi, two packs of Newport shorts, and I went home and I drank myself until I cried. Now, Toni Braxton had just released her first recording, her first solo CD, not LP, CD. And there was a song on there, cut number 11, a song called Best Friend. And it was the story of her girlfriend cheating with her husband. And that's not what was going on in my life at the time. But there was one line in that song that I wrapped myself in. And it's a line that goes, I didn't have the strength to live, but much too young to die. I had just turned 25. And I knew that I was heading home to gift this autographed photo to my mother for Christmas. And that was the hardest call I ever had to make. I'm the only child. I am a mama's boy, and I wear that title proudly. And I drank myself to build up the courage to tell my mother something. And I just heard her voice. And she said, sweetheart, what's wrong? And I said, I let you down. I tested positive. I'm going to die. And she said, we'll get through this. So without missing a beat, she told me, put the liquor bottle down go to sleep, we'll talk tomorrow. Just know that I love you. So I went home and my mom became my very first HIV AIDS educator. She had recorded and the band played on and we sat in our apartment at that time. And I told her my fears, but I knew that her love would carry me. So I returned to New York and I thought that I could make it, just to make you all a little jealous, I spent New Year's Eve that year with Lauren Hill of the Fugees at a concert. It was really cool, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. But after the new year, I knew that I needed to be home. So I called my mom and I said, can I come home? And she said, sweetheart, I was hoping that you would do that. So that was February of 1994. I moved back home weighing 127 pounds, and my family gathered because they all knew by this time. And so my family assumed that I was going to die at some point soon. I had just turned 25. I had planned my funeral. I refused to cut my hair. 
I allowed it to grow to the nape of my neck because I felt like Samson. It was my only source of strength. And then I was introduced to him. In our community, he's lovingly referred to as Dr. Bob, Robert Bob Higginson, physician assistant. And I walked into that appointment with my head held low, self-esteem out the window, and I'm just waiting for him to tell me, this is your time frame. And he looked at me, and he shared just simply, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You do you, as young people say today. You do you. I got this. So as I approach 25 years of living with HIV, December 6th of this year, he was right. But I go back to what my mother said, we're going to get through this. And what's heartbreaking is that I recently did a presentation at one of the universities, and someone said, HIV has been eradicated. And it broke my heart because the face of HIV doesn't look like what it looks like today. It's no longer a white gay man's disease. It's a disease of communities of color. And the stories that were plastered on major magazines and the cover of newspapers as it affected the Caucasian gay community are now relegated to a brief blurb in the metro section. And yet the rates of infection among young MSMs of color, young men who have sex with men, are forever increasing. Young men between the ages of 18 and 25. And we're fighting a losing battle. But we also know what we know about HIV disease today, November 17th, 2018, no one ever has to test positive again. We know how HIV is transmitted, and we know how HIV is prevented. No one ever has to test positive again. However, we also know during the time that I'm here on this stage, every nine minutes, somebody tests positive for HIV infection. So, we need to continue to keep HIV information to the forefront. Bring it back to the newspapers. Have conversations with your girlfriends at high tea or at the beauty parlor. That's an opportunity that we call teachable moments. So I don't know what my journey is going to be like or what's ahead of me. I'm open to the wonderful possibilities because the short lady who told me that we would make it never lied to me, and she's with me. So I don't know what's going to happen on this journey. I can tell you what has happened. I married an incredible gentleman, my partner. We celebrate seven years in February. I am the stepfather of three incredible young people. I'm the proud father of three incredible puppies. We may not see a cure in my lifetime. We may not. But I'm going to leave you with my mantra that I use, that I carry with me. And it's a song by the gospel singer Smokey Norfolk called Run Till I Finish. And I wish I could sing, but I would never do that song justice. And it says, I have decided committed that I'm going to run, no matter what comes. I have decided to run this race, nestled in amazing grace. I've made up my mind. I don't have much time, but I'm going to run till I finish. 
Thank you.